everybody and welcome to the first webinar of the National Research Collaborative Meeting 2020. Thank you for joining us. We are very excited to be able to deliver what we hope will be a series of excellent webinars with world-class speakers. Tonight's webinar is Granule, Generating Student Recruiters from Randomized Control Trials. This short introductory course is designed to equip you with the knowledge and skills required to recruit patients to randomized trials. You will gain insights into common sources of difficulties when inviting patients to participate in randomized trials and ways to mitigate these. You'll be given tips and strategies with regards to conveying clinical equipoise, explaining randomization and engaging with patient preferences. I will now briefly introduce our three speakers for tonight. So firstly, we have Dr. Leila Rashines, who is a senior lecturer in qualitative health sciences at the University of Bristol. She has a background in using qualitative research to enhance the design and conduct of randomized control trials. She is a member of the Quintet Research Group, which specializes in supporting recruitments to challenging randomized control trials. We also have Dr. Nicola Mills, who is a senior research fellow at the University of Bristol. She also has a specialist expertise in the application of qualitative research methods within trials to improve recruitment and inform consent. And she's also a member of the Quintet Research Group. And finally, we have Dr. James, uh, Mr. James Glasby, who is an NIHR doctoral research fellow in global surgery at the University of Birmingham. He has research interest in global surgery, clinical trial methodology, and perioperative care. He holds steering role in national and international collaborative, collaborative research methods, such as global surge and COVID surge. And that's at the NIHR Global Health Research Unit in global surgery. I would like to say thank you very much to all our speakers for this evening. It is a privilege to have you here with us. And I will now hand over to you to start this webinar. Lovely, thank you very much, um, Lauren. So we're really delighted to um, talk to you, everyone tonight. So thank you and a very warm welcome and to the virtual granule. So we're absolutely delighted to see so many of you, I think it's 82 people have joined tonight, which is amazing. Um, I hope you'll find the session informative. It's not too heavy, it is a Thursday evening. <laughs> so we hope that um, you'll actually find the session fun as well as um, educational. So um, we've all gathered tonight to think about recruitment to randomised control trials. James is soon going to explain why it's so important for trainees to have a good working knowledge of this area. As many of you know, um, RCTs sit at the very top of that evidence hierarchy, but recruiting sufficient patients to answer those research questions can be incredibly challenging. So whilst the plan is always to smoothly work towards your recruitment targets, the reality is often somewhat different. And this can lead to requests for costly recruitment extensions, or even worse, the early closure of an RCT. So as I'm sure you can imagine, there are many consequences um, to trials not hitting their recruitment targets. So first off, importantly, this can lead to delays in generating that much needed evidence to improve patient care, which is why we do trials after all. And sadly, we may never get the evidence if trials close down. In many cases, um, much needed RCTs are actually just never attempted <coughs> because there's concern that recruitment won't be feasible. It almost goes without saying um, that you don't want to be part of a trial that's miles behind its recruitment target because it can be incredibly stressful. Um, so extensions are very hard to negotiate. And even if they are funded, they can be hard to accommodate as you know the world keeps moving and new studies are coming on board every day. And finally, um, again, this is a fairly obvious point, but um, um, under recruitment can be a, a huge kind of waste of resources. And this is particularly um, difficult to get your head around when, when so many trials are publicly funded or, or charity funded. So the good news <laughs> is that there are strategies to improve recruitment to um, RCTs and reduce research waste based on a thriving uh, body of research that's ongoing in this area. And uh, there are now quite a few um, evidence-informed strategies to help support recruitment. So tonight, we're going to focus on just one element of recruitment. This is the recruitment discussion. So that's the discussion 
discussion between the doctor, nurse or trainee and the potential trial participants that so could be a patient or a service user. Now, it may sound like this is, um, it, it might set, sound like this is a simple thing to do, but what we hope you'll take away from tonight is that that recruitment discussion is so different to a routine clinical consultation in so many ways, um, in its aims and in the components of that discussion. And you'll see what I mean by that as we get through the next um, three talks. So I'm now going to hand over to James, who's going to just um, give you a quick overview of, of what granule actually is. So I hope this works as I... Over Thank to you, you James. Much, <laughs> It's such a pleasure to be here with you all. It's such an exciting collaboration between Bristol and, and Birmingham and all of the amazing work that you, your team do in, in the quality of research backing up um, randomised trial recruitment. Um, in terms of why together we set up Granule, um, about four or five years ago, you know, we, we had a look across the curricula of different medical schools and, and training schemes, and we saw there was basically no information provided about randomization to, to clinical studies and we know that these are the studies which change practice around the world so there absolutely should be something that trainees are involved in and at a higher level there's trainee chief investigators now of big nihr funded trials there's several notable examples and um, so hand in hand we have to learn how to recruit using the best possible principles in order to give every patient the opportunity to be involved in research so we set up this course which started as a full one day course mainly for medical students but trainees came in in waves shortly afterwards and we trained some simulated patients who were actors from whichever area we were running in the course in and um, how to be a, a patient and some of the challenges that we, we sometimes see in the recorded recruitment scenarios and since doing that course, i think we've run five or six now as, as a full day course supported by the the Bow Research UK charity. And we've also created a sort of mini course which lasts between one and four hours and runs over all these key concepts and people can practice with one another. And that's been run now, I think, over 20 times across seven or eight different countries. And we've actually embedded some of the learning around this into our uh, what's called site initiation visits, which is where you set up hospitals to begin recruiting to trials across the global surgery network. So um, it's been really well received and we're delighted to, to present our first iteration of this virtually this evening. So your feedback on this is really important because I suspect in the post COVID world, we may be doing more and more virtual granules into the future. Uh, next slide, please, Leila. Uh, so I think from a clinical perspective, one of the things that you'll, you'll find coming out tonight, you know, this absolutely is not about selling a treatment or, or, or a trial to a patient. And this is Harry Wormwood from one of my favorite childhood films, Matilda, um, Matilda um, where he, he used to sell uh, broken down cars, which he uh, reversed the speedometers and filled them full of uh, sawdust. And that's absolutely not what we're here uh, to talk about today. This is about giving patients the opportunity to be involved in research and about challenging when patients have incomplete information and ensuring that patients have all of the information they need to decide whether or not they're involved in research. Uh, next slide again, please, Leila. Um, so these are a couple of pictures from the last course we did in, in Europe and internationally in Kigali um, in Rwanda uh, last year, just to emphasize that this is now you know, an international course, mainly focused on surgery, but has broad principles which are applicable to any speciality domain and I know Nicola and Leila and the team have walk, worked across many different uh, trial types. Uh, next slide please. Um, so just to open some of the discussions, um, we usually would ask for lots of back and forwards from the audience and we'd hear about your horror stories and things that went well with trial recruitment but um, unfortunately of course with the virtual platform that's a little bit more difficult and we're about 10 times bigger than the usual courses we, uh, we run. Uh, so, Phil, could we cue the first live poll, please? Uh, so we'll get a little bit of feedback to start off with about what your experience has been to recruiting to trials to date. Uh, I don't know that, Phil and the backroom team, if you've got that going. Um, so whilst we're, whilst we're waiting, another key point is whilst we don't have that kind of face-to-face -face interaction, if you've got any questions or thoughts or comments throughout the evening, then please do highlight these on the chat and we'll try to come to them as much as possible. 
I don't know whether we are going to, oh, uh, shared poll, fantastic. So yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that, uh, perfect. We've well, got about uh, 16 people have voted so far, I think. Perfect, so please do keep voting. Ah, perfect, we've got different platforms. So please, please do vote, so we've got a bit of a, a sense of how people are doing. So we've got, um, About 40 votes so far, please do keep voting. There's about half of you still left to vote. So we've got at least sort of half of the audience that's had no experience so far to um, randomize trial recruitment. So you're in the perfect position because you won't learn any, you won't have learned any bad habits, um, which is something that I certainly had to unlearn. Uh, and we've got some people that said that they've had a lot of experience, just about 15% or so. And then sort of the middle level saying, um, that they've just had some experience. So a really good um, breadth reported. Um, so I'll hand over to um, Nikki next uh, to try and uh, talk a little bit further about the, the, the granule course and its importance in the Quintet research. Actually, James, you've got one more slide there. Ah, perfect. Um, yeah, so I think one of the other things you'll notice is that um, the, uh, the associate PI scheme, which has now been taken up across lots of different trials, uh, in surgery and beyond and, and beginning to be taken up internationally uh, also includes the, the granule course. So we'll provide all of the links and things at the end to access this and NIHR Learn. Uh, this is a really important scheme and comes hand in hand uh, with the granule course. So um, another sort of point relevant to trainees. Thank you very much, Taylor. Thanks, James. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, myself and Layla, um, we work within the Quintet Research Group at the University of Bristol. Um, we're headed by Professor Jenny Donovan there in the, the blue jumper in the top right photo. Um, and we, I'm sorry, I just shut up chat. We very much focus on understanding and addressing challenges of um, recruiting patients to randomised trials, and particularly those where the treatments are um, very different or, or very controversial. So trials in which recruitment um, is anticipated to be difficult are essentially the ones that we really like to get our teeth stuck into because uh, clearly we don't like an easy life, I guess. Um, and it's not just about optimising recruitment, but we, we make sure that all patients, all the eligible patients, have actually got the opportunity to make an informed choice about whether or not they want to take part in the research. So it's, it's equally about um, optimising informed consent as well as optimising recruitment. And that, that's quite crucial. And that's what we hold kind of quite close to our heart as well as when we do the research. Next slide, please, Leila. Um, so the team, we've actually worked with over 60 RCTs over a whopping sort of 20 odd years, I think, um, to try and understand and address recruitment challenges. And we've obviously accumulated and synthesized um, a lot of knowledge um, from our prior work over this time. And there's um, it's just some of the publications that we've, um, we've written based on uh, sort of challenges of recruiting to trials. Um, and a lot of the a lot of this work that we've done has, has drawn up on um, clear obstacles of recruitment, but it's also identified there being a lot of hidden challenges of recruitment. Um, particularly issues around conveying equipoise, explaining randomization, and then engaging with patients' treatment preferences. And the, um, the recruitment challenges and strategies that you'll hear about in this webinar draw from this work. Um, so that's probably a good place now to, to share this work. Um, and we've got three short lectures um, looking at the key components of RCT and identifying what the, the key issues are and some strategies to help you overcome that. So first up is Layla, and she's going to tell us all about how to convey equipoise. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Nikki. So, um, yeah, first off, um, we're going to cover this idea of conveying equipoise. Um, so first things first, how do we define equipoise? What does it mean? So if you look to the academic literature, you'll, you'll find a host of different um, definitions for equipoise. It's actually quite confusing um, and there isn't really a, a clear cut, one all encompassing definition. Um, but there is a common running theme across a lot of the published literature. 
And this is the idea that equipoise is a position of uncertainty around which approach, treatment approach, is best. So this is the fundamental principle that underpins any RCT, because if we knew what which treatment was best, then obviously that's what we would be offering to our patients as long as the treatment was accessible and affordable. So that all seems fairly um, simple when you've got a red pill, blue pill scenario. Um, but we often tend to deal with very different treatments, or in some cases, it's, it's more than two treatments. And it's often the case that we know, already know some things about those um, options that we're comparing. So we might have personal experiences, or we might know of some outcome data already. But if there's a need for an RCT, we probably don't have high quality data from a head-to-head -head comparison of the treatments that we're comparing. So the principle is still the same, really, that according to current, current evidence, we don't know which is the best treatment in relation to whatever outcomes that we're interested in. Now, being in equipoise can be challenging if you're a medical practitioner. And this is because clinicians don't practice in a vacuum. They have their own, um, they can have, I should say, their own impressions and their own experiences be that what they were taught by their mentors or um, their own successes and failures um, in their history of treating patients. So as a consequence of this, clinicians can have their own views about which treatment option or approach is best. And those views can range from just a hunch to very strong beliefs. And it can be very difficult for um, clinicians to just switch those beliefs off. So we know um, from previous research um, conducted by um, Jenny, I've got the paper reference there on the slide for you, um, that clinical professional support, that they find it especially difficult um, to ignore those hunches and those beliefs when they're face to face with an individual patient. So even if they support the RCT, it's very difficult to switch those instincts off when you've got the patient right there in front of you. So in recognition of these challenges, um, the term clinical equipoise was proposed. And this is sometimes referred to as collective equipoise or community equipoise. And this refers to the idea that there's uncertainty across the clinical community around which approach is better. So a surgeon um, or an oncologist in, in one hospital might have a hunch that one approach is better, whereas, you know, 100 miles um, up the motorway, uh, another surgeon might have the opposite view. But the important thing is that collectively, as a community, we don't know which is best. And this situation is often deemed as the, the absolute perfect basis for conducting a randomised control trial. But of course, we still need those individual clinicians <laughs> to recruit our patients. So even if they're not um, individually in equipoise, we still need them to, to do the work. And so this is where, and as I mentioned earlier, that this is a an ongoing area of research, but we do have some tips to share with you um, to equip you to still recruit patients into RCTs, even if you're not, um, don't feel um, perfectly in equipoise yourself. So the first thing that we need to do is acknowledge in our discussion with the patient that there is uncertainty around which approach is best. And there are various ways in which you can do this. So these are all examples that we've um, taken from audio recorded consultations where uh, clinicians have um, attempted to recruit patients into a range of different RCTs. So we've got on the left here around um, statements like we don't know what's best. We're trying to find out um, if one treatment is better or if they're both the same. We're not sure which treatment is better, is it, if any, and so on. But is that enough? <laughs> so acknowledging there's uncertainty is often the easy bit. But what we say throughout the rest of that recruitment discussion needs to back up that idea that we really are uncertain. So we, don't, we need to try and not inadvertently um, suggest that one treatment is better than another. So this is um, almost our, um, our suggestions, really, for how to think about conveying equipoise in the context of a clinical consulta a, a recruitment consultation with a patient. So we suggest that you think of equi conveying equipoise as communicating the idea that the patient wouldn't be in any way advantaged or disadvantaged if they were to be allocated 
to any or either of the dry lands. So in other words, it's helpful to think of it as this perfect state of balance. Now, um, you'll see this in the next few slides, but that balance can be very easily tipped, often inadvertently. So based on um, listening to lots, hundreds of audio recorded consultations, we found that equipoise can either be overridden or undermined. And I'll explain what that means in a second. So overriding equipoise is where um, clinicians essentially offer recommendations for one treatment over another. So this is to give you an example from a real recorded consultation. A recruiter might start off with very good intentions by saying something like, we don't know which treatment is best. But then later on, as you get into the consultation, they may say something like, but for patients like you, I would say that surgery might be the better option based on your age. So um, it looks like this, this would be a very easy thing to avoid. You may be thinking, oh, I'd, I'd never do that. Obviously, that's not conducive to recruitment, but you'd be surprised how often this actually happens in practice. And this, in a way, links back to um, what we were saying about it being difficult to switch off those gut instincts when you've got the patient sat in front of you. So more subtly, equipoise can sometimes be undermined through suggestions, subtle suggestions that one treatment might be more suitable for the patient than another. And that can happen in a variety of ways. So one way would be by expressing an opinion or a hunch, even though you might caveat that with uncertainty. So statements like, I think, but I might be wrong. <laughs> Sometimes it's easy to um, overly emphasize a particular advantage or disadvantage of one treatment or another, or fail to mention the uh, advantages or disadvantages, and all of that can throw off your balance. And finally, we can inadvertently imply that one treatment is better than the other through our use of language. So we refer to these terms as um, loaded terminology. So I've put up a couple of um, common, common terms that can throw off your balance. Um, you, we see these pop up in quite a few RCTs that we work on. Not all patients react to these terms the same, the patients are individuals, but there can be a tendency if a recruiter is to describe a treatment as gold standard for patients to interpret that as the best treatment. Um, sometimes recruiters will refer to the experimental treatment or the experimental arm, and that can sometimes be perceived as the riskier treatment, and it can um, kind of evoke these ideas of the patient being a guinea pig. But the important thing to take away, there's one thing you take away from this talk, is that um, problematic terminology that disrupts equipoise is often, it's generally very context specific. So you need to work out what's throwing off your equipoise in the context of each individual RCT. So I'm going to show you some examples in the next few slides where um, terms that are fairly innocuous on their own can throw off your balance. So the example um, that I'm going to play for you, hopefully the audio will work, is taken from a trial um, that um, it was a cancer trial. It was looking at the treatments for esophageal cancer. So one group of patients um, received chemotherapy followed by surgery, and uh, the other group would receive um, chemotherapy followed by radiotherapy. So essentially, this was a trial almost comparing surgery and radiotherapy. You're going to hear from the recruiter. In this case, it was a surgeon. You'll hear from the patient and the patient's relative. So I'm hoping this will now work. Um, Phil, we're, we're ready for the audio. OK, so here we go. So essentially, what we all agreed was that there are two types of treatment that we could give you. The first is what we've always described as the standard treatment, which would be chemotherapy first to shrink this down and then an operation to remove it. Then the patient says, mm hmm to give us a chance of a cure. The other type of treatment that we've used over the years is treatment which doesn't involve an operation, which is chemotherapy followed by radium treatment or radiotherapy to the area that's involved, where the cancer is and the lymph gland. So um, the key thing here, the patient's response is then, 
the thing that's worrying me that is that if she has the chemo and the radiotherapy, if that doesn't take it away, she mightn't be able to have an operation. But if she has the operation, then it's gone. The doctor responds with, it's gone. These are all sighs. <laughs> These are all very, very sensible and rational feelings. And they come into the equations to whether you're happy for us to, to, go, to go this route of the study. So um, what I wanted to show here was that the problematic terminology here is this reference to um, the operation removing the cancer um, to give the chance of a cure. But um, there's no real description of what the radiotherapy is doing. And um, this was uh, turned out to be a bit of a recurring issue in this particular RCT. So the team had to think about, well, how can we describe what the radiotherapy is doing? And they came up with this um, solution of uh, explaining that it destroys the cancer. And um, it, it seemed to make a, a, a difference in, in how um, patients responded to this RCT. So um, I was going to show you one more example of, um, of how you can undermine equipoise through disclosing opinions, but it's a very long extract and I'm, <laughs> as the sound is a little bit dodgy, um, I'm very happy to share these um, slides with anyone at the end and hopefully talk through it if you have any questions. So I'm not going to go through it, but I will go through the key point which says that if, even if you express a slight hint of an opinion, patients will pick up on it. Um, so in, in, in many ways, equipoise or conveying equipoise is like walking a, tight, uh, a tightrope. It's a very good analogy when you're um, thinking about how to communicate equipoise in different RCTs. So if I, um, some final tips here for you on uh, conveying equipoise. Uh, remember that the possible advantages of one treatment um, should generally be counterbalanced with possible advantages of another, and the same applies um, for disadvantages. It can be quite helpful to think of treatments as trying to achieve the same outcome, but perhaps in, in different ways. So I like to think of it as the same destination, but perhaps by different routes. And reassure the patient. Um, just let them know that you'll, you'd be happy for them to be allocated to either or, or any of the um, trial arms, because as far as current evidence would dictate, um, all are equally suitable options for the patient, as long as they're eligible for the RCT. So I've only given you um, one side of the story here. I've um, focused on what recruiters um, um, say to patients, but of course, recruitment discussions are an interaction, they're a two-way thing, and patients will bring their own views and, and treatment preferences to the table. And sometimes um, what recruiters need to do is think about how they respond to those treatment preferences to maintain this state of equipoise. So on that point, I'm going to hand over to Mickey, who's going to give you some tips on how to deal with patient um, preferences if they pop up in a consultation. So over to you, Mickey. Thank you, Leila. I have no audio in my slides. I like a simple life. Stop sharing. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Leila, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so one of the further challenges of... Um, uh, recruitment discussions is what to do when patients express a preference for a particular treatment and we know that this is very common there's a large proportion of patients that will often come to a recruitment appointment with a particular treatment in mind and just following on them from what Leila was saying um, the implications of undermining or overriding equipoise is that it can build or, um, or cement, reinforce patient treatment preferences. And so recruiters have a role in shaping patient treatment preferences, and that's just worth kind of taking note of. Um, this is a good example of a recruiter shaping a preference. I'm going to show you an extract from a consultation um, discussing recruitment to a trial, and it's a trial that was comparing open with keyhole surgery. So I'll just let you read this. And then a bit later. Okay. 
Okay, so, I mean, it's clear to see from that really short extract that equipoise has actually been compromised. In fact, it's kind of been overridden. Um, and the result of that overriding of equipoise is quite clear in that the patient has then said, well, actually, then I think I should just have keyhole, keyhole surgery. Um, and then perhaps not surprisingly, then, when you look at the, the screening log record, you can see that that patient chose the treatment that she was steered towards. So, you know, as a recruiter, you need to be very aware of the role that you can have in shaping a patient treatment preferences. Um, and we know from talking to recruiters that managing these preferences can be really challenging and actually quite an uncomfortable thing for them to do. So they've said to us that patients have come with preconceptions and they already have made decisions or all those who've said no have very good reasons. There's nothing we could do about it. So preferences are one of the most commonly reported recruitment obstacles that we hear from recruiters. So I just want to unpick those quotes for a minute and let's just take this first statement, they've already made their decisions. Well, yeah, patients will come to an RCT recruitment appointment with a particular treatment in mind. So for example, they may say things like, I think I'd like to have, would prefer to have the surgical treatment, or active monitoring sounds to me like the right thing to do, that's what I feel at the moment, or I think I'll probably go for at this moment in time, if you said we need to do something about it, I think I'd probably go for the radiotherapy. And in a lot of cases, we've seen that the recruiter then accepts references at this point, and that's kind of the, the end of that recruitment discussion. And actually, in some consultations, we've seen the recruiter go a little bit further and actually agree with the patient that, yeah, I think that treatment preference is right for you. So, you know, we have seen that happen. But if you break down how those preferences are actually expressed, okay, it often reveals a lot of hesitancy and uncertainty. So if you look at the text in red there, I think at the moment, um, probably, you know, preferences are not always as firmly held as they may first appear. And that's worth bearing in mind. And what we find is that preferences are voiced um, early on in the consultations, when they come into that, that initial discussion, they tend to be expressed on a continuum. And you have hesitant views down at one end and more stronger, firm opinions at the other end. But what we find is that most of these preferences actually hesitant end of the spectrum. And we also find that levels of knowledge varies with this initial preferences. And we find weighing up the treatments in their mind. And they're basing that on information from various sources. So this might be more formal sources, like they're getting from the patient information sheet or GP, surgeon, whoever. Or it may be from more informal sources, such as from family and friends or you know, newspaper, support groups, whatever. Um, and on all of which, all that information is going to be a variable reliability and variable quality, and particularly that from the, the more informal sources. And perhaps not surprisingly, we often see that preferences are based on misconceptions or incomplete information. And these were some quotes that we picked up from some recruitment consultations. So, you know, patients were thinking, well, radiotherapy makes your hair fall out and having surgery can put cancer someplace else. And then just going back then to those quotes, let's think about this second quote, there's nothing we could do about it. Well, kind of beg to differ there. Um, I mean, there is something we can do with treatment preferences. So rather than accepting them at face value, um, to actually engage with those preferences. And this isn't about coercion um, or not respecting patient's choice. It's actually giving the patient more choice. You know, you're giving them the choice of a trial and it's also about assessing informed decision making. So how do you do that? You know, how, how can we go about actually doing that? So we've looked at preferences um, across a number of different trials, and we've identified some effective strategies that we've seen um, recruiters undertake to actually managing preferences. And I think firstly, it's important to not accept the preference straight off, to actually acknowledge that preference and to open up the conversation. And this really simple but effective strategy, OK, but, is a really good way of achieving that. So, for example, I want bypass because I need a permanent solution. OK, it's great that you're thinking long term, but all these operations are intended to be permanent. OK, really simple but really effective strategy for opening up that conversation. And then once you acknowledge that preference, then request that patient to keep an open mind. Because they've heard 
all the information about the treatments. Okay, so this just enables them to think beyond the preference. Again, another simple, straightforward strategy, but can be really effective. So for example, I appreciate what you say about monitoring. And if at the end of this discussion, if that's what you feel, we will support you, whatever you want to do. What I'd like to do is just keep an open mind whilst I run through all the treatment options. Because there are things about the treatments that you may not have considered. And then it's really important to try and elicit and explore the underlying reason for the patient's preference. You know, what is it they understand about that preferred treatment? What is it that's driven them to that? Because this can sometimes reveal misconceptions or um, incomplete information. And so once you've unearthed this, you've then got that opportunity to correct those misconceptions or to fill in the gaps in their knowledge. So, for example, I know that surgery is your least preferred option. Um, is it the fear of an operation, going through surgery, or are there things that you'd like to discuss that I might be able to perhaps relieve some anxieties about? Okay, so it just kind of enables you then to assess their understanding and then you can gently correct them if needs be. So once you've unearthed their underlying reasons and beliefs, it's really important that you provide info to balance the preference to ensure the, the patient is actually aware of sort of all the pros and the cons of all the different treatments and then to tailor this to their specific concerns or beliefs, whatever it is they've, they've raised. So for example, if you read that, Okay, I've tried reading it, it's too quick for me, I can never keep up with it, so I'll just let you read it. Um, so this is a really nice example of balancing. So here we see the recruiter emphasizing that surgery, which is the patient's preferred treatment, also has side effects. But they're also addressing the concern that they have with their neighbor, so they're bringing that in, so they're tailoring their response to the patient's particular concern. And the other neat thing about this is they've also highlighted uncertainty around the best treatment as we can see here in red. And this is all part of the balancing act that um, um, Leila was referring to earlier. And emphasizing uncertainty can be a really good thing to weave throughout that recruitment discussion. Um, also, as we've seen here, in response to a voice preference. And then the final strategy you could use in response to voice preference is um, to reassure the patients about the study treatments. So if it's the case, you could say that both types of treatments have been used for years, they're not experimental in any way, and you're suitable for both of them. Um, and we're here to help. I'd never think about it as something that I didn't think might be a benefit. No, no, that's reassuring. But then how far do you go? You know, you could just imagine a scenario where you keep kind of like going around in circles and, and engaging and responding and counterbalancing with the patient preference. But, you know, at what point do you stop? And I think if you're satisfied that the patient is, is sufficiently equivocal and prepared to at least consider all treatment options, then they are in a perfect position to be offered randomization. But if a patient has a clear and informed preference, then they should quite rightly have it. You know, that is an informed choice, and that is a good outcome of the discussion. Yes, it's not great for your recruitment target, but nonetheless, it's a good, uh, a good outcome of the consultation. And what we found is that patients' preferences, they often dissipate um, in light of this gentle exploration and full information, and with a lot of patients then being open to consider randomization. So I hope that's just given you some food for thought um, around preferences and some useful strategies and how you can actually engage with them rather than just accepting them at kind of face value. Um, so some simple strategies there summarize this kind of okay but, um, requesting an open mind, um, exploring the rationale and understanding of the treatment, balancing their views so it's tailored to their particular concerns and emphasizing uncertainty, not knowing what the best treatment is, and then again, reassuring the patient. Um, and these strategies, you can use them in kind of various combinations at various time points throughout the consultation. Um, and it will just help you determine whether the patient's making an informed choice about study participation. And then the final point I just want to leave on is it's worth remembering that engaging with preferences should not feel like a challenging or coercing patient, but it really offers the patients an opportunity to fully consider taking part 
and also for the recruiter an ability to consider how well informed they are so it just enables a more informed decision a um, couple of references there where the, the data was drawn from um, Leila I'm not sure you bugged our short course in Bristol <laughs> Sorry, I think he glossed over that, so it's a good job I've got it there as well. Um, we, we do have a kind of large whole day course which we're going to attempt to run online for the first time on the 7th of May, so wish us luck. Um, right, so that's preferences, and then the final key component of the RCT discussion is explaining. Um, Nikki, um, yeah, so we've got, a, we've got a couple of good questions in the chat. Oh, okay. um, I think we might, we might um, have, have time to just quickly address them. Yeah. Yeah. We've got a comment here from Irina saying consent is the process and um, most patients do not have medical knowledge. Should it be mandatory to not complete recruitment within a single session? Um, I'll take this on quickly. Yeah. Um, it's a good, great point, Irina. Um, so the answer is no, you absolutely don't have to consent a patient within one session. In fact, um, I can't think of... Uh, yeah, it's, it's a split. It depends on the nature of the RCT, but certainly I think um, I'm, I'm, half of the trials I've worked on, maybe more, tend to do the consent process over more than one direction. Um, so it's a good point. Um, another good question here is, is too much choice a cause of confusion? How do you deal with information overload? Um, in, in a way, I think that the second comment, kind of uh, the comment uh, that uh, follows that point, uh, is a good response to that. So, you can deal with information overload by not trying to cram too much information into one consultation, if that's possible. Um, any other tips, guys? I guess, as we said right at the beginning, that this is just one part of a broader recruitment process. So for elective surgery, you'd hope that you'd post out a patient information sheet or patient information video before the patient ever comes to clinic. So they've got a good idea of what the trial is about and some of its meaning uh, before you ever start this recruitment consultation business. But lots of trials are done in the emergency setting too. I think it's really important that we chunk and check and use those kind of communication skills we use then in, in, in medical school and really try and deliver the information in lay language as much as possible you know record yourself doing this and uh, and then tell yourself off when you use scientific terms brilliant thanks james i think yeah. i think we're good yeah yeah let's hand over to james and tell us all about um how to explain randomization in a nutshell Fantastic. Such interesting talks. Thank you. Thank you both. And um, so I've got the job of explaining the purpose and process of randomization. And now this is a little bit more nuanced um, in, in some senses. You can get that balance. Um, you know, you could have spent ages, you know, hours and hours with patients across several consultation um, consultations trying to maintain that balance. And then you can get to the um, randomization part. And if you explain it in too complex a way, then you can lose the patient and that all that work you've done to challenge preferences gently and maintain equipoise and ensure your equipoise, the patient's equipoise and community equipoise can all be uh, lost. Um, so we'll try and explain a couple of good tips for explaining randomization now. Um, so I think probably everyone on the call will know what a randomized trial is, but just to remind ourselves that randomization is one of the key ways that we can overcome selection bias in research. So for non-randomized research, there's always a reason why people have been given one treatment rather than another. And you can adjust for these things in using statistical methods, but you'll never be able to adjust for the things that you haven't measured within non-randomized studies. So the only way that you can balance both known and non unknown confounding within a research study is to get to that a randomized trial, which is why description of this is so important. And if it's so important, um, surely it must be something that we're very e easy to explain. And even the MRC, um, who lead lots of methodology research, they previously funded this uh, work in Bristol, uh, recognize that randomization, it, you know, is not an easy concept to, to understand. Um, it's not just one thing and another. It's difficult for scientists, difficult for the clinicians, and it's really difficult for patients. Uh, I'm a surgical trainee in, in surgery. We are um, compelled in our training to have confidence in what we are doing. You know, we wouldn't take someone to theatre and open up their their belly if we weren't sure that it was going to to help them in some way. Um, so I think um, it's difficult to explain this idea of uh, 
giving someone a treatment which you're not sure about. Um, so one way that we uh, sometimes see uh, surgeons and doctors explaining this process in these recorded interviews is the idea of these gambling metaphors, you know, a blip of a coin or a roll of a dice. And it, I guess it's a, an attempt by the clinician to try and make these things more accessible to, to patients, which of, of course should be applauded. Um, but I guess the problem perhaps is that if you are undergoing a trial for a cancer treatment and you were you know, very concerned about this and um, you, you know, potentially risk of dying as a result of the, the surgery or the cancer itself, then this idea of your future almost, your fate being down to the roll of a dice or flip of a coin may seem a bit flippant. Um, so these are a few examples that we pulled out from the research led by um, Marcus Jepson. Uh, so this example is someone will roll the dice and then you've got a 50-50 chance of getting the treatment or not. So I wouldn't want a 50-50 chance of whether my outcome would be good or not after surgery. Here, you, here we have sort of your name is drawn out of a hat or a flick of a coin. So whilst these techniques, you can see why people use them to try and um, get across things in, in a lay sense, probably recommend avoiding these because they, they may not be taken well by patients. A second method that people sometimes use to explain randomization is the idea that we will put their details into a computer and the computer will decide which treatment um, they will get. And anyone that's been involved in programming computer algorithms to, um, to, to, to randomize patients will understand that I suppose that is kind of what happens. You know, you put in the patient identifier and then out comes a, a random allocation. Um, but for patients, that can be a real challenge. So let's look at a few examples. Um, well, we enter you into the computer and it decides. If you chose to go into the trial, then we have a computer which chooses the treatment arm that you go into. Or perhaps uh, we therefore are going to use a computer program to allocate the treatment. And can you see um, that uh, it is conveying this idea that the computer has some information about you in which it's making the best decision? It sounds like there's this gold standard point where you're putting in special features and it's programming you know bespoke medicine deciding which treatment you should have which of course is the exact opposite of what a randomization algorithm does and um, so here a patient said i want what the consultant thinks and not what the computer says they didn't like the computer um whereas patient b said actually you know if the computer's going to decide then i'll definitely get the best treatment and neither patient has got a, a complete understanding of this and would give their proper informed consent for the research. So one way to get around this problem is to remember this kind of clear and simple rule. And in as few words possible, you know, try and avoid the word randomization if you can. Talk about the process and the purpose of randomization. So the process of randomization is that it's a method for producing two groups that are as equivalent, as equal, as similar as possible. And the reason for that is that it enables a fair comparison. So let's have a little look through how we might say that in practice. Well, we might say that if you choose as the patient to be involved in the research, neither you nor I or anyone else will actually decide which treatment that you have. It will be decided by this process called randomization. So your details are put into our system and then the treatment is decided purely by chance. This means that you'll have an equal chance or you could say a fair chance of having either of the two treatments. And then when we're describing the purpose, we might say that you know this is a method for achieving groups of patients that are, are as similar as possible. And you could give um, an example and um, so say, you know, that means it's the same number of young ladies in both groups, the same number of elderly men in both groups. And this means over the course of the study and the thousands of patients that will be involved in it, it allows us a fair comparison where the only difference between the groups is the treatment that's been administered. So I think, um, oh yeah, so I guess um, the last point to say on this is that when people describe randomization, often they kind of, uh, give this idea that there's this kind of battle between the two options, so you can kind of choose one option or the other, um, and then it, it gives patients the false sense, to perhaps in some sense, in some um, trials, that if they weren't involved in the study, 
that they could have either one of the treatments. Often we're testing a, a novel treatment or one which is um, only tested within the realms of a trial. So I think it's important when we present the um, randomization to patients and um, the trials to patients that they have two options. And one is they either go into the trial and they have this even chance of having either treatment or they are not in the trial and they have the standard treatment. Uh, in this occasion, the patient, of course, said, oh, I'd love to join the research Thanks for explaining randomization in such a simple way. Okay, so I think this is time for an uh, embarrassing video that we recorded earlier. Um, Phil, it's the one I sent you earlier today, if that's okay. You have to give me, it was a sweaty, warm day in the... If you were happy to be involved within the study, an important thing to say is that neither you nor I nor anybody else would be able to choose which one of the three or which combination of the three you would get um, allocated to. So that's, that's going to be, so how would that be chosen then? Um, so that's done by a process called randomization. Um, and the premise of that is that you have an exactly equal chance of being given any one of the combinations of having the interventions. And that's done by taking your details, putting them into our system, and then you're completely at random allocated to one of those combinations. The idea of that is that over the body of the study with all of the thousands of patients that um, we discuss and, and consent to be involved in the study, there is an equal number of men and women and people of different ages within each of the different groups of interventions. So that the only difference between the groups is the interventions that we're testing. I hate watching videos back of yourself. You always notice things you did wrong. But there you go, an example of using the purpose and process of randomization. So um, to conclude the randomization section, so remember that this is sometimes where you can lose patients after all of that marvelous work you've done to keep their aquapoise. So focus on a simple description, talk about the purpose and process. And if you can, avoid gambling metaphors or saying that the computer's gonna decide what they want because that, again, may lead the patient astray. Um, some references there for your interest. So that is the end of our um, presentations um, for today. Um, so we've got the opportunity now um, to look at a live consultation that was recorded with uh, Professor Jane Blaisby that's led some of this work with the social sciences in um, Bristol. Um, so we've got uh, two videos uh, depending on time, we may uh, dispatch you with one at the end of the session rather than showing you both during uh, this, um, this live session. Uh, but we will have some time to go away and have some, uh, a little talk in some small groups uh, after this short video. So everyone needs to find a pen, please, and a piece of paper or um, a Microsoft Word document, perhaps, if you're on a computer. And we would like you to take uh, a few notes during this um, short video to about the principles we've described today about equipoise, about challenging preferences, and about randomization. And then within some small groups, Jane Blaisby, I'm one of the consultants here and professor of surgery. Okay. And um, we've come to talk about this cancer that you have in your gullet. Yeah, yeah. So as you know, over the last few weeks, you've had a lot of different tests. Yeah, loads. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. It's so important we get as much information as possible to make the best decision. You've had a CT scan yeah. and a telescope test yeah. and that extra PEC scan as well, yeah. I think. So what we did is we took that information and as our team meeting last Friday, we looked at all your details and we thought we'd work out what the best treatment was for okay. you and there are two treatments there could be a treatment that involves surgery or a treatment that involves radiotherapy okay I mean what would the surgery would that just come cancer out. Yeah, so I'm a surgeon, I work in this surgical team, there's six of us here, we've worked together for 
for at least 30 years now. We have a special this unit we work really closely with the intensive care doctors and do these esophagectomies. In fact, when you look at the national figures, we've got some of the best outcomes okay. in the country. And yes, the surgery is to cut it all out. That's right. Okay, so in my, I just sort of think if that's the, I would prefer just to get rid of it. I just wanted to get it out. To know. That, that for me is just cutting. Out. Yes, although surgery, I mean it. cuts it out. We can't guarantee it's going to work, but it certainly, you know, gets rid of the majority of the cancer. And it tries to get rid of it, yes. And what was the other option? Well, there's also the option of radiotherapy. You'd go up to the oncology centre and you'd have some radiotherapy. You'd have to ask the oncologist about that okay. mainly, I, I mean, think. what would yes. you think about it? I mean, what, as a surgeon, I mean, I don't know, what do you think? Well, it's difficult option? to know what's best, but we've, we're very used to doing surgery here and, we, you know, we're, as I say, we have a very good team approach yeah. for dealing with it and we can manage any complications from surgery that might arise. Uh, I mean, how, yes. uh, we're doing some research at the moment where we're trying to work out which of those two treatments is the best one. I mean, I yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't really like the sound of radiotherapy, to be honest. Okay, you don't like the sound of it. Okay, no. right. So, I mean, if it, if we could just go for the surgery. Okay, you'd like to go for the surgery then? Would you? Yeah. Fine. Would you like to come with me, and we'll send you to the pre-op clinic? Okay, then. Thank you. So. have a think about um, what was good, what was less good about this consultation and try to think about it in terms of what you've just heard. So in terms of whether, whether Jane conveyed equipoise, whether she addressed the preferences, um, how well she explained randomization and just try to engage with some of that, that material or thinking about that video and come back then at 10 to. That would be great. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Jane do well in her consultation. Keep an eye on the. I should I should say that um, Jane was trying to do a bad consultation. This this isn't her actual practice. <laughs> it's actually surprise. It's really difficult to get a subtly bad uh, consultation. It's uh, very adeptly done. <laughs> <laughs> um, certainly, we are discussed and said that. Uh, there was definitely like quite a lot of reassurance around, um, you know, if you if you were getting a surgical therapy, then it conveyed quite a lot of confidence to the patient and the patient. Uh, so in a, in a clinical sense, that was positive. We've got some um, comments coming from chat. About the, uh... We've got good positioning, good body language, tone and pace of speech. Uh, one group liked the introduction and the recapping of the investigations conducted so far. Tips for the comments from And so, so let's hear it then, guys. What what could have been done better? So what, can you, can you, one of my um, members um, said that we need to get a nurse to do the recruiting because the nurse would be a lot more neutral because um, the surgeon was very pro-surgery and really bigged up their centre. So maybe the nurse could be a lot more neutral. And I pointed out actually that the nurse tends to be uh, just as effective at recruiting and tends to be quite a bit cheaper. <laughs> Point raised there. What else? Yeah, we had a lot of discussion as well around the... Um, the imbalance and the length of the descriptions and about how if you're going to recruit patients for trials like this, you have to upskill yourself to give that balance. Or again, other as you say, other members of the healthcare team often have this balance. You can even have multidisciplinary clinics sometimes where you have all the team members present. Um, 
we also chatted about how this was probably just a small snapshot of a much longer recruitment process actually for this child, which is quite quite complex. We had a lot of discussion in my group about um, the imbalance between the trial arms and how um, the, the recruiter didn't seem very comfortable talking about radiotherapy. We've got some similar comments coming in through chat. So um, could have been better if there was better exploration of the patient's concerns around radiotherapy. Confidently, our group thought the idea of the research study was introduced very late on in the consultation and preferences yeah. were not challenged, but instead accepted. Yep, yep. Similar thing came yeah, up. That came up with, yeah, that came up with us too. And um, yeah, we spoke about like as much as you can to try and introduce the idea as early as possible, even if it's in the pre-booking or pre-op clinic, you know, as, as early as you can mention the idea of research. The best. Yeah. I think so we basically covered the fact that she didn't really convey equipoise, she didn't explore the preferences and she didn't really explain the study or even mention randomization for that matter. So um yeah, a good good effort at doing bad, Jane. Very hard to do. Should we um show the the kind of how it could be done version of the video? So my name's Jane Blaseby, I'm Professor of Surgery here, one of the consultants. Yeah. And we're going to talk about the cancer that you have in your gullet. Yeah. You've had a lot of tests now, yeah. and CT scan and a yeah. telescope test and that extra PET scan. Yeah. And we looked at all that information at our specialist meeting last Friday and we talked about what the best treatment might be for you. Okay. And the answer is we don't actually know what the best treatment is. There are two treatments right. and we're uncertain which one works best. Right, okay. Um, Right, okay, so what, what are the treatments? Well, at the moment we're doing this trial, we're part of this national trial research okay. study which is actually trying to work out which treatment is best. <coughs> okay. And there are two treatments, there's a treatment involving surgery and a treatment predominantly involving radiotherapy. Okay, I mean, see in my opinion I just think surgery, if you just cut it out, it's out, it's gone. Okay. And I just, I want it gone, I don't like the idea of having having cancer. So you, so you think that surgery will just cut it out? Yeah. Is that why, you, why you're yeah. interested in the surgery? Yeah. Okay. Well, I wish that were the case. Okay. I mean, surgery removes the main cancer, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't remove the bits of the small cancer cells that might have escaped elsewhere. Right, okay. And when those cancer cells have escaped elsewhere, you can't see those at the time of the operation. Right. And then the risk is it comes back afterwards. Okay. And so surgery, I'm afraid, doesn't guarantee a cure. It tries to cure it, but it doesn't guarantee a cure. So there's always a downside of surgery. Right. And the other downside is that there can be serious, really serious complications of the oh. operation itself. Right. That, that sometimes it's so serious you can actually end up in hospital for weeks and end up not even recovering from right. the surgery. Oh, gosh. I, I mean, and the other one is that is that... Can you guarantee a cure from the other? Well, radiotherapy doesn't remove the cancer, but what it does is it sort of burns the cancer and kills the cancer cells. Right. And that also doesn't mean it deals with the ones that might have escaped, but it really does kill the cells that are there, and then you don't have to experience the possible risks of an operation. You don't have to be in hospital for two weeks. There may not be serious complications. Uh -huh. And as far as we know at the moment, although there's no real answer, it has just as good chance of getting rid of it as the operation itself. I mean, what would you, I mean, obviously you're a surgeon, I mean, Adam, what would you recommend would be the right one? Well, I think it's really worth keeping an open mind about both and thinking how can we, you know, I don't know what the right answer is, else I'd be recommending it, but okay. I would think it's worth thinking, would you take part in this study? I don't know. I mean, I don't really like the idea of radiotherapy. That's the what, What's worrying you about radiotherapy? Uh, I mean, I, uh, my neighbour, uh, my she had um, cancer and she had radiotherapy. She had really, really bad Did uh, she? side effects, and it just, it, uh, you know. I just don't know if I want those. And what sort of cancer did your neighbour have? She had breast have? cancer. Breast cancer. And did she have really sore skin? Really sore skin and she just found it very uncomfortable and, you know. And that is completely different. Okay. Completely different. And how old was your, your neighbour? Do you know? She was, I think she's in her 50s. In her 50s, sim a similar sort of. Yeah. Oh, well, it's really very different. In this situation, having the radiotherapy and coming into the courses of radiotherapy is actually much less onerous than having a major operation with all its risks, I think. And the question is, which gets rid of it and which is the least problem in the long term, okay. really? They say it's a 
that's a trial. I mean, what is the research study? Yes. So, if you took part in the research, okay. then you wouldn't choose the treatment, and I wouldn't choose the treatment. Okay. There would be a process called randomisation that would allocate you to one of the two treatments. So I can't just turn around and say, okay, I want the radiotherapy or I want the. No. The reason why we do that is because we want to have groups of people, some who are having radiotherapy and some who are having surgery, who are similar. So right. we don't have lots of old people in one group or lots of men in the other group. So we want to have two equal groups so that in the long term we can make a fair comparison of okay. the outcomes of surgery or radiotherapy. It helps us answer the question for future people that might get the disease okay. so we can really then recommend to them what to have. Oh, okay. So it's like, all right. so like say, my daughter or whoever. Or my son. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's a benefit to the people in the future. To you, we keep a closer eye on you because you're part of research. Okay. But in the, at the end of the study, we'll be able to benefit future and people. And both will hopefully deal with my cancer. As, as far as we know, they've both got an equal chance okay. of dealing with the cancer. We can't guarantee a cure with either, right. but we think they're very similar. And that's why we're doing the study, okay. to work out which ones. So, so if I do the study, I won't know whether I get the surgery or the chemotherapy, but I... You'll find I out after we've done the process of, and you've signed the forms, we'll be able to tell you which okay. one you'll have, which we'll be able to do very soon for you. The nurse will meet you outside and we'll be able to tell you. If, if, they, if they both have a chance of, you know, not curing or helping or getting with the cancer or whatever, then I'm happy to go with it. I just, okay. I just think that makes me think about, you know, my, my children, you know, you just have to think about that. Yeah. You want okay. Other well, we'd think. like to introduce you to our research nurse who's going to get yes. some more details then if you'd like to come. Okay. Through. Hi everyone. Right. Well, I hope that's just giving you an insight into um, how you can do it and how you can do it really well. And I'm very impressed that Jane still managed to do it within five minutes as well. Um, so a little bit longer than the other two minute video, but still remarkable to have, um, you know, a, a really good. Uh, I hope that's just giving. Oh. Right, hang on a minute. I'm just and muting. I'm very impressed that Jane still managed to do it muting that. Um, so um, there's a link there if you want to um, go and listen to the, the video without the kind of lag. Um, but please don't share it. Please just use it for educational purposes for this particular session webinar today. Um, questions and comments. We're, I'm aware that we're out of time now, but I think we're going to hang around in the coffee room, although we think that should be renamed the gin room, really. Um, but just to say that that's the end of our show. Thank you ever so much for coming. Um, I just hope that's given you an insight into some of the common sources of difficulties um, of actually inviting patients to randomised trials. And I hope we've also offered you some 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 tips, some strategies that you can actually employ when you get out there in the field. Um, and just say thank you so much for everyone who organised behind the scenes. Um, the, the tech guys, the organisers have been amazing and so patient as well today with all our technical practices. So thank you ever so much to everyone and thank you ever so much to everyone that's attended. Um, hope it's been good. Just want to draw attention to um, an online granule training that we have. It's hosted by the NIHR Learn, and um, we have a kind of mini granule session in their approved national learning directory. I haven't put the link up because it's just, you know, a really long, silly link that means nothing. If you just Google NIHR Learn and granule, it will take you there. Um, and if you want more information on the content of the webinar, um, then have a look at the Quintet webpage. We've got a list of publications um, and, and we tweet occasionally when we remember. And there's our email address as well. So please do get in contact and if you want any more kind of discussion um, or whatever or, or direction to particular papers or whatever. So thank you very much. I think it's 